Okay, so this is a, uh, a video reviewing the uh, bill of lading, which is used in the international transaction. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the diagram we're using for the international transaction. And we have the sales contract, which of course covers offer and acceptance and then uh, excuse, uh, being excused from performance, force majeure events. Uh, and we're, we're here in the lower portion where the seller has delivered the goods to the carrier and the carrier has issued the bill of lading uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the seller. So um, the way this would normally work is that the uh, seller would present the bill of lading to the buyer for payment or if there was a letter of credit involved, present it to the buyer's bank for payment or if there was a confirmed LC, he would present it to the seller's bank, which would then present that bill of lading to the buyer's bank. And assuming there's a complying presentation each time, the person would have an obligation to, uh, to pay. So, and a complying presentation means that all of the documents set forth in the letter of credit have to be presented, and the bill of lading is one of those documents. Uh, so, um, uh, here we're just talking about the bill of lading, and I'm using it as a shorthand for all of the documents that need to be presented to constitute a complying presentation. Uh, and we're just focused on bill of lading because it's one of the most important documents in the transaction. So the bill of lading uh, serves several purposes, and the first is that uh, it is some proof or some evidence that the seller has actually performed under the contract meaning that um, when he presents the goods to the carrier, uh, the carrier, in theory, should not be issuing a bill of lading unless he has actually received goods. So it, it is some evidence that the seller has performed his contractual obligations. Secondly, uh, whoever uh, holds the bill of lading actually has the right to claim, uh, claim the goods. So uh, <clears throat> where you see the bill of lading move through the chain of custody, <clears throat> if at any step along the way somebody is not paid, then that person uh, can always claim the goods and, and use the goods to uh, liquidate the goods and offset uh, any payments he has made. So in, in a sense, it gives you legal title or certainly the right to claim the goods. And it also means that the carrier should not be delivering the goods to anyone other than the person who presents a, uh, a properly endorsed uh, bill of lading. And the third purpose is <coughs> the contract of carriage, where on, typically on the reverse side of the bill of lading, there's lots of small type, which sets forth the contractual obligations of the carrier uh, to deliver the goods. So uh, the bill of lading is, is, is a critical document and serves these three purposes in the international transaction. Uh, there are a couple types of bills of lading. The only one we're focused on here is the negotiable bill of lading. And what that means is that it has been properly endorsed through the chain of custody. And uh, negotiable is a legal term it refers basically to uh, what we call commercial paper. And the easiest example uh, to relate that to something you, you already know would be a checking account. So uh, if you have or had a checking account at some point, uh, and you know, I'm not sure people use checks that much anymore today, but <clears throat> you know that you write a, Smith, you write a check to Bill Smith for uh, $50, and you sign it and then present it to Bill Smith and Bill turns the check over and endorses the back of the check and then he presents it to the bank for payment. If he did not endorse the check, the bank would not pay him. When he endorses the check, the, the check becomes, it is a negotiable uh, document, meaning that at that point the bank has an obligation to pay the presenter uh, the uh, the $50 or whatever the amount is on the check. So the bill of lading is something like that. As it moves through the chain of custody, uh, the seller's bank, buyer's bank, and people endorse it, it becomes a negotiable bill of lading. 
uh, meaning whoever holds it uh, can basically claim the goods. <clears throat> this is in contrast to a non-negotiable bill of lading, uh, which just it doesn't work for this type for payment against documents transaction. So the only ones we use here are negotiable. And to distinguish them from non-negotiable, they're typically uh, printed on yellow paper. The, uh, the bills of lading are regulated by a federal statute in the United States. Uh, it's it's uh, called the Federal Bills of Lading Act, or sometimes the Pomerine Act. Uh, they talk about negotiable and non-negotiable bills of lading. Uh, again, the only one we're concerned with here are negotiable, and, and that's, uh, we should assume that all bills of lading in this course are negotiable bills of lading. Okay, so let's just take a look at the, uh, the first case, which is the Hewlett versus Expert Concrete case. And I think this gives a pl pretty clear example of, of how the bill of lading works. Uh, so in this case, uh, there's a contract for the um, sale and purchase of four uh, Putzmeister pumps. Uh, the seller, Joel, as I recall, I think is in uh, Korea, South Korea. The buyer, as I recall, is uh, possibly in uh, New York or New Jersey. And uh, if you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that much about pumps, but I do know Putzmeister pumps are uh, serious pumps um, that uh, do, uh, are for serious jobs. So for example, when the tsunami hit uh, Japan and the nuclear reactors were flooded with water and they needed to pump the water out of the reactors, they, they ordered Putzmeister pumps. So they are big pumps, they're expensive pumps. Uh, I think these pumps are worth, uh, they cost roughly about $150,000 $150, a piece. Uh, they can be used to pump concrete uh, at con construction sites. And of course, concrete is, is pretty heavy. So these are, you know, they're pretty serious pumps. So the buyer is trying to buy four of these pumps. The seller demands a letter of credit. Uh, so the buyer goes to his bank. He opens an LLC, but the buyer's bank reviews the creditworthiness of the buyer, and he says, I'm only willing to extend to you credit for three of the pumps. And roughly, if, if each pump is, let's say, $150,000, what that means is the buyer's bank has determined that the buyer, the buyer shouldn't have more than a, roughly a $450,000 line of credit uh, based on his business operations. So, of course, the, the buyer says, I really need this pump. And the bank says, I'm sorry, I, I can only do uh, up to a line of credit sufficient to buy the three pumps. So the buyer goes back to the seller and says, look, um, I, have the, I have the LC for three of the four pumps. Why don't you um, ship those to me, ship the three pumps, uh, ship all four pumps, and I'm talking to the bank, I'm getting the uh, financing worked out. And I should have it worked out by the time the pumps arrive here in, uh, I think, New Jersey. So the seller does that. He, he packs the three pumps in one package. The fourth pump is separate. And um, he ships the pumps. But um, he presents the, uh, the bill of lading for the three pumps to the buyer's bank and, and is paid for the three pumps. But he holds the bill of lading for the fourth pump. And the theory being that even though the pumps, he knows the pumps will arrive at their destination, he knows that the carrier will only give the buyer three, the three pumps and hold the fourth pump. So the, um, the pumps are shipped. They arrive in New Jersey. Meanwhile, the seller has presented the bill of lading for three pumps to the buyer's bank, and he's been paid for the three pumps. So all four pumps are there. They go. The buyer goes to the dock and tries to claim the four pumps. And of course, the carrier says, "You only have a bill of lading for three pumps. Uh, I can only give you three pumps." So the buyer basically, you know, 
talks up his game and whines and says, "Look, I'm um, looking. Uh, I'm working out the financing with the bank. I really need the pump. Uh, why don't you give it to me?" He says, "I can't give it to you without the bill of lading." So the buyer goes back to the seller and says, uh, <coughs> I'm talking to the bank, the buyer's bank, and uh, they want proof that I bought the, the pump. So can you give me the bill of sale uh, so I can show them that I'm actually buying this pump? So the seller um, says, okay, um, we'll give you the bill of sale, but we're going to continue to hold the bill of lading. So so the question here is, what is a bill of sale? Well, a bill of sale basically is a proof that you've purchased personal property. So you go into a jewelry store and you buy, you know, uh, uh, emerald uh, earrings or a ring or something, and um, you pay for it, and then they give you a receipt at the cash register. The receipt is the proof that you purchased uh, the jewelry. It's how you prove ownership of the personal property. For real estate, in contrast, you prove uh, by uh, legal title that is registered in uh, a local real estate office. But personal property is proven by the bill of sale. So the seller gives him the bill of sale, but holds the bill of lading, and then the buyer goes to the carrier and says, "Here's uh, I'm here to get the fourth pump. Um, and the guy, the doc, uh, longshoreman looks at it. He says, well, this is a bill of sale. I need a bill of lading. And he says, well, uh, I don't have that yet. Um, this is what I got. Well, I can't give you the pump without the bill of lading. Well, but I really need the pump, and I got a job, and I have to get this done, and... and uh, the, you know, the bill of lading, it's on, it's on its way. I just don't have it yet. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't worry. Uh, I can bring it to you tomorrow. But uh, right now, this is all I have is a bill of sale. Of course, he probably goes to his supervisor. Yeah. Hey, Joe, you know, should I give him the, should I give him the pump? Uh, he's got the bill of sale. He just doesn't have the bill of lading. And the net result is they decide, okay, give him the pump. And they take the bill of sale. And, of course, what happens is uh, the buyer never gets the financing from the bank and he never, never pays the seller for the fourth pump. So, of course, what happens is now the carrier sues the seller. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The, the seller sues the carrier and says, hey, I didn't get paid for that pump and you need to pay me. You were not supposed to give him that pump without the bill of lading. So I still have the bill of lading. So there's a lawsuit between the seller and the carrier, and indeed the seller wins, so the carrier has now paid the seller, and in exchange the seller now has given the carrier the bill of lading. Now the carrier sues the buyer and says, you owe me the 150000 for the pump. And that's what this case is. Hewlett is the carrier, and Expert Concrete is the buyer. And that's what this case is. That's how this case came about. And the answer is, of course, the, car the um, carrier improperly uh, gave the pump to the buyer with the bill of sale. The only correct document to use is the bill of lading. So, and that is the reason why the carrier lost in the lawsuit against the seller. In this case, however, the carrier wins because on a different theory, which is basically expert concrete, has been an unjust enrichment with this fourth pump, and he owes the, uh, owes the money to uh, the carrier who actually technically holds legal title with the bill of lading. So the outcome is that uh, expert concrete has to pay the carrier the $150,000 uh, or whatever it is for the, uh, for the payment. Look at the Westway case. And uh, so here's a case where Westway is the buyer and it orders about 1,700 cartons of coffee from 
uh, a company, Dominium, in Brazil for delivery, delivery to New York City. So um, the seller loads the cartons of coffee uh, under the supervision of the Brazilian Coffee Institute and drives the coffee to the port uh, of Santos and they're stored overnight in a warehouse. Uh, and they confirm when the cartons arrive at the warehouse they weigh the same as when they were loaded at the uh, at the coffee uh, at the coffee's company at the buyers Westways uh, facilities. So the cartons uh, are then loaded on the ship, and the carrier issues a bill of lading that says said to contain seventeen, roughly seventeen hundred cartons of coffee weighing roughly seventy seven thousand kilograms. Uh, the cartons arrive in New York City, and it turns out that 419 cartons weighing 20 tons are missing. And the question is whether the carrier is now liable for the missing coffee. And the answer is basically yes, and part of it is that it issued the bill of lading, the carrier issued the bill of lading, which is primary evidence that it received the coffee that is specified on the bill of, of lading. So if you look at the opinion, it says that uh, um, it's true that under the explicit wording of the statute, uh, a, a bill of lading attesting to the apparent order and condition of the goods will not constitute a prima facie showing of absence of the concealed internal conditions that were not apparent to the external observer but there's no similar condition in another statute regarding the recording of weights in bill of lading. Once the carrier lists the weight of the goods, which normally would be readily available to the carrier, and in this case, certainly 20 tons of coffee missing would be readily apparent, he represents he has no reasonable ground for suspecting that the weight of the goods actually received is different from what he has put on the bill of lading. So the point here is that when he says he received the coffee and it weighs 77,000 tons, he cannot later then say, I didn't know I was missing 20 tons, when 20 tons should be pretty apparent to a reasonable person, the missing weight would be readily apparent. And a similar case, Beresford Metals versus SS Salvador involving missing uh, ingots, 40 tons of missing ingots, and it, it, the missing uh, 40 tons should have been readily ascertainable when they were loading loading the uh, goods on the boat. So, um, you know, it it is, when it has reason to know something is missing, it is liable for that. If it has no reason to know, then it won't be liable. And the Jane Irrigation versus Chemcolite case is, is, is that situation where now they were shipping 700 tons of a PVC resin from Texas to India, and the packing was done by the seller, not the carrier. So the carrier does not have control over it. And it turns out the weight uh, they, they deliver it to India, and it turns out it doesn't, does not contain the chemical. It contains chemical waste and dirt. And the point there being that the chemical waste and dirt weighed about the, the same. The containers weighed about the same uh, as the chemical itself. So there was no reason for the carrier to know. There were no red flags that something was wrong. So in that case, where he says uh, it is said to contain because the buyer tells me that, he is not liable for it. He had no reason to know otherwise, and the goods were packed by the seller. So the point here is when the carrier is issuing the bill of lading, parties are going to rely on his representations 
on that bill of lading as that paper circulates through the chain of custody to the uh, confirming bank, the issuing bank, uh, for payment terms. So what he says is important, and he may have liability. So the carrier has an interest in r limiting his liability. And the way he does this is to basically protect himself by using magic words if the, if the shipper is packing all the goods, he doesn't really have an obligation to unpack it and inspect the goods. He protects himself by using these magic words such as said to contain. And that will protect him as long as he has no red flags indicating something different. So if you look at the uh, Pomeranian Act, uh, the carrier is not liable for misdescription of goods when the shipper packs and loads the goods, when he uses these magic words such as said to contain, shippers weight, load, and count, contents or packages of contents of packages unknown, or words of the same meaning. And those words will protect him as long as he has no reason to know otherwise. Now, it's simple for the carrier to count what is being delivered to him. So, for example, uh, the seller delivers uh, 200 Samsung ultra high definition 4K television sets, and there are uh, four boxes with 50 television sets in each box, it's pretty easy to say four boxes times 50 is 200. So quantity is something the carrier can easily determined, determine, but quality is something different. Uh, if it turns out the television sets are not 4K sets, maybe they're only 1080p sets, the question is, is he liable? Or suppose uh, the, the refresh rate is allegedly 240 uh, hertz and uh, it, the sets shipped are only half of that, 120 uh, hertz or megahertz. You know, is he liable? And the answer is no, because that goes to the quality of the goods, not the quantity. And nobody expects him to turn on the television set or here, plug in a Blu-ray disc player to determine whether it actually plays Blu-ray disc players or is actually a 4K television set. He's not required to test or evaluate the quality of the materials, but he is expected to count. Counting is relatively easy. And the final point I'll make here is that as these documents work their way through the chain of custody, and specifically like the bill of lading, the person who endorses the bill of lading, like the seller and then presents it to the confirming bank, the seller's bank, they are under law, they're making certain warranties about that document. And they're making a promise or representation that to the best of their knowledge, the document is genuine. It's not a fake. They did not print it on their computer. They have no knowledge that it's invalid. Uh, there's no reason to think there's something wrong with the document. And to the best of their knowledge, the transfer is fully effective and in accordance with the law and procedures. So the, these representations, they make these representations when they endorse the back of a check, for example, or endorse the bill of lading and present it to the bank for payment, uh, these representations or warranties are implied as a matter, as a matter of law. Uh, there's been some effort to switch over to electronic bill of, of lading. Those have not, efforts have not been very successful. There's something called CDOCs operated by it was at the time Chase Manhattan Bank. There was another one, the Bill of Lading Electronic Registry Organization, Bolero. That none of these have really worked, partly because um, there's a sense of a monopoly control by 
one bank over the system and partly because there's just concern about uh, fraud and the bill of lading is such a critical document in these transactions uh, you know, fraud is a is a pretty major uh, point so to sum up the the carrier is issuing the bill of lading and he is at and his representations are important to all the parties who will receive the bill of lading and the chain of custody but at the same time he's trying to protect himself against liability so that if the goods are different than what he represents he wants to uh, limit his liability and the Pomeranian Act here says basically he's liable for damages for non-receipt of any goods represented on the bill of lading and then paragraph B says unless unless these conditions are met. So you see the less control the carrier has over the goods, uh, the lower his risk of liability. So the shipper is loading the goods, uh, they're, they're packed and sealed by the shipper, uh, he, and then he protects himself with these words. He is effectively limiting his liability unless uh, there is some reason here for him to know something is wrong, something is amiss, or what we say is that there is a, uh, a red flag. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll stop here with the bill of lading, and um, that's, that's our discussion on bill of lading.